global warming. Where water's getting scarcer and arable land shrinking. It's now being claimed that we're entering upon a sick mass extinction. Earth, as we know it today, will cease to exist. There is new information that reveals just how fast the world's... What if economic and financial markets could save the planet? We use nature because she's valuable, but we lose nature because she's free. If we invest money in protecting nature, we'll earn very, very high financial returns. Financial returns. Economists, bankers, investment funds and financiers are taking an interest in the environmental crisis. They say that they can protect the planet their way, with money. How much is the beach that you visit every year actually worth? How much for the forest that you love to walk in so much? What is the value of a plant, a mammal, an insect? Does this combination seem at all unnatural to you? Financialization equals to rape of the earth. Endangered species and forests are treated like financial products. Can markets succeed where politics have so far failed? But at what risk? At what price? Sometimes I describe the challenge that we have as the economic invisibility of nature. What I mean by that is that most of what nature provides is not transacted in markets. Whether it's clean air or fresh water, or whether it's the pollination of bees for fruit trees, when did a bee ever send you an invoice? Billions of workers twilling away without a break, in silence and for no pay. For millennia, no one recognized neither their value nor all the work they do. It took a tragedy for us to finally recognize their economic value. In the US, a large part of the natural wild bee population has died off. The same thing is happening in Europe. There are hundreds of people who keep large numbers of bees. Uh, they keep them in hives. And when a farmer wants his fields pollinated, uh, he actually calls one of these commercial pollination firms. You know, there's a rate for hiring a million bees for a week uh, to pollinate your crops. What if tomorrow they were to disappear entirely? What if we had to replace these bees with humans and therefore pay them? The pollination service of bees is economically invisible, but the total value of that was found to be something like $200 billion. That's almost 8% of the total agricultural output on Earth. We look at these little creatures differently now that we know that they are worth $200 billion, don't we? we immediately pay more attention to them. All that wealth in a beehive. And we humans never realized it. Mr. Johnson? Yes? Hi, Mother Nature here. I'm here to collect for last month's nature usage. Nature usage? Okay, let me see. The sun rose and set, oh, look at that, every day. There was that cool breeze on Tuesday. But what if the solution was already here? We just need to put a price on everything that nature provides. Pollination, the pleasure of walking in a park, clean air. How much will it be worth? Wow, that is a good question. Um, hmm. How much would it be worth? You can't put a price on it. You can't put a price on it. You can't, you just yeah. can't. It's priceless. I want nature to be free. Nature was there before we were and we should learn how to protect it and that should not have to do something with money.
My daughters live in a, in a flat we have in, in New York. This is on 56th Street. But if I had bought the same flat in 58th Street, I checked and the value was more than twice as much. Why do you think the value between 56th and 58th Street for the same area, 1,000 square feet, is twice as much? Because the one that is on 58th is next to Central Park. So just the ability of people to see greenery is worth $1 million extra. And I see you're running a little behind on your oxygen bill. I wouldn't let that continue very long if I were you, Mr. Johnson. Well, I'm a little short this week, so I... Uh, uh. So, will that be cash or charge? Il y a une citation d'Oscar Wilde qui dit euh, « Les cyniques connaissent euh, le prix de tout et la valeur de rien ». Je ne suis pas cynique et je pense que connaître euh, le prix de la nature, c'est aussi lui reconnaître de la valeur. Parce que, euh, encore une fois, aujourd'hui, dans le système tel qu'il fonctionne, on peut le regretter, mais ce qui n'est pas compté ne compte pas. Our economic system was created in a very different era. It was created hundreds of years ago when what was valuable, what was scarce, were capital and labor, right? So that's what we put a value on. All the natural resources, all the ecosystems, all the clean air, clean water, there was too much of that, you know? And so we didn't put a value on it. Having plenty of clean air, water and animal species is of no interest to the markets. They hate things that are abundant and free. The equation is beginning to change. Nature is the El Dorado of the 21st century. A new economic sector with promises of huge returns for investors. Banks, finance, corporations and states are attracted into it. They all know that on a dead planet, no one will do business anymore. On va arriver en 2048 au dernier poisson extirpé de l'océan. Ok, on n'en parle plus. Le comportement de l'humain aujourd'hui, on peut se rencontrer un peu partout, comme il détruit les écosystèmes où il les pollue, il les extirpe, il les surexploite, fait qu'on a une situation assez ambiguë où, sur un moment de l'histoire de la Terre, on a un maximum d'espèces. On en détruit beaucoup plus vite que ce qu'on est capable de laisser régénérer en fait. Et la préoccupation elle est là. That's fundamental economic theory, you know, supply and demand. The more there is supply of something, the less the price. The less the demand, the less the price. But the more the demand and the less the supply, the higher the price, right? And effectively right now, the price we're putting on the environment and on natural services is zero, effectively. But that's going to have to change as the supply of these natural resources continues to dwindle and the demand in the form of people continues to grow. Applying the law of supply and demand to natural resources and species is something new. Until now, almost no one had ever thought of putting life itself into the economic machine. Il y a vraiment euh, une emprise euh, d'ampleur géologique des humains euh, sur la planète. La vitesse d'extinction des espèces, c'est 100 à 1000 fois plus rapide que la moyenne géologique des 500 000 dernières années. La dernière fois qu'il y a eu une crise de biodiversité aussi violente, c'était il y a 65 millions d'années. This was the time of one of the greatest geological disasters. The dinosaurs disappeared, and along with them, 70% of all animal species. We could now be in the middle of a similar crisis. Only this time, it's not a meteor that caused it, it's man. Los seres humanos existimos por millones de años, pero este proceso de destrucción de la naturaleza se ha dado solamente los últimos 150 uh, años. En otras palabras, no son los seres humanos los que están destruyendo la naturaleza, es un sistema económico. Since the Industrial Revolution, 
the world's population has increased sixfold. Water consumption risen by a factor of three. The amount of carbon in the atmosphere has doubled. The global temperature has increased. And half the world's rainforests have disappeared. Our ecological footprint is escalating. To satisfy our needs, we are using the resources of one and a half Earths. If we continue at this rate, by 2030, we'll need two planets. By 2050, two and a half. What happens if there are very much less trees, if there's not the clean water we need where we need it, when we need it, if there isn't the clean air where we want it and where we need it? That becomes scarcer, that becomes more valuable. We're going to start to put a price on it. We're going to start to put a price on the destruction of it. And we believe there are opportunities in that transition to profit from that transition. Besides, business has already started. About 100 miles east of Los Angeles, there's a fly. Probably the most expensive fly in the world. Here it comes, right here, flying right by us. That is one of them. Here it is again. See that up there? A century ago, there may have been on the order of around 40 square miles of, of habitat. Um, that is essentially the distribution of the sand dune. And over the 20th century, 95% of the remaining habitat has been destroyed or converted over to other uses. Only a small fraction of that 5% supports good populations of this rare insect, this Delhi sands flower-loving fly. And they emerge during the heat of the summer and the adult fly only lives for a few days at the most. Colton County underwent huge economic development. Business and industry gradually swallowed the sand dunes, while the so-called Delhi sandflower-loving fly had the sad honor of becoming the first American fly on the endangered species list. To protect it, in 1993, the state froze all commercial activity on its habitat. Colton's growth dropped to zero, all because of a bug. The citizens here, you know, want jobs. The citizens want retail services. They want more businesses to be here. And right now, we're prevented from bringing them into town. So the fly found itself hated by the entire population. But one man's misfortune... The fly is a rare species with rare property. It makes a very good financial investment. We can create as much value for both our stockholders as well as create a biological opportunity for conservation by turning that into a mitigation bank. So our most recent sales have been $250,000 an acre. A bank saw an opportunity here, a mitigation bank. It realized that it could make money off these useless little sand flies. It bought a part of the fly's habitat and then it did nothing leaving the insect to live in peace while selling shares. If a business wants to develop a project on the land where the fly lives, it will find itself blocked by the state. But by buying shares, the entrepreneur can offset his impact by investing in the insect's protection and secures his right to develop his business. The bank has already made $20 million. The free market tends to find out a good balance between adequate conservation share of value and allowing development to go forward. A bank making money by protecting a species. That sounds like a win-win situation, right? But for the inhabitants, the bank is still a fly in the ointment. The fly is winning the war. With the flies in place, we've lost millions and millions and millions of dollars, years and years and years of time, 
you know, we can't replace what we've lost. It would be cheaper to pay people to go out and kill the flies than to mitigate. Joke, joke. Okay. But true, but true, but true. So. In the United States, species protection is in the hands of these new bankers. Businesses, estate agents, road builders, anyone whose activity endangers animals has to pay these banks. They protect more than a million acres of land. They sell wetlands credits, cacti credits, prairie dog credits, even lizards' credits. Wildlands is the biggest mitigation bank of the American West. Our annual revenues uh, exceed $40 million a year in mitigation sales. We mitigate for giant garter snake, for salmon, steelhead, delta smelt, split tail, Swenson hawk, for burrowing owl, for desert tortoise, elderberry longhorn beetle, tadpole shrimp, fairy shrimp. Our customers are aware of the, the local solutions that we can provide. Now these customers will come and say, I'm building a shopping center and I'm infecting vernal pools, I'm infecting a burrowing owl, do you have something that can help me offset my requirements? So we take a look at our inventory, we provide them a quotation for a solution, and then we barter that, those credits to them. It's in a non-tangible transaction. When we give them a relief of their liability, it's a certificate of goodwill. But how do these banks choose to invest in and protect one species rather than another? And what happens to those endangered species living in areas of the US where there's nobody? where there's no economic development, and therefore, no one to buy credits. Choosing between one endangered species and another endangered species, it all depends on market demand. Buying landscapes, protecting landscapes, accumulating new landscapes, it's a phenomenal opportunity to be able to use a business model to achieve sustainability of nature. If we weren't profitable, we wouldn't have money to reinvest in these future projects. The laws of the market applied to endangered species. Surprising, right? How can we let banks decide which species are worth saving and which ones not? Which ones deserve to live and which are to die on the altar of profit? If you were to go on the speciesbanking.com, you would find probably about 700 different banks. Um, and it's roughly, uh, it's roughly between two and a half to three and a half, four billion dollars a year that are in banking. This market for endangered species is developing. Today, all these mitigation banks are listed. You want to know which one protects the Swainson's hawk, the tiger salamander, or the desert fox? With one click, the endangered species appear and the number of credits issued. Va a haber especies de la biodiversidad que sean más lucrativas. Por lo tanto, van a tener mayor flujo de inversión. Mientras otras especies de plantas o animales que no sean tan atractivas van a tener menos flujo de inversión. Por lo tanto, Estas van a ser privilegiadas, mientras que estas van a correr a desaparecer. Hi, I'm John. I work for a company, a big company. A company that still doesn't realize it relies on nature, which is why I'm organizing a meeting, a big meeting, to discuss natural capital. It's a new idea to boost our business. You've heard of financial capital, right? So what is natural capital? Natural capital is capital which nature created, not us. 
So uh, the climate system is natural capital. There are trees are their natural capital because they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen. So biodiversity is a form of natural capital. So let's take a shoe. This one's a leather. Leather comes from cows. To make a cow, you need grass and grain. That's a lot of land and a lot of water. It provides the clean water that we need, the healthy food that we need. Nature, through things like forests, provides us protection from storms or floods. And that's what I mean by nature's fortune. And so um, when we speak like academics, we call what nature does for us ecosystem services. So nature has become a real business. It has its own capital and can offer its services to consumers. Without rain in the Amazon rainforests, there would be no agricultural economy in South America. A service estimated to be worth $240 billion. There is an area that is the oceans, coral reefs. As you can see, they cut across the entire globe, all the way from Micronesia across Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Madagascar, and to the west of the Caribbean. These red dots, these red areas, basically provide the food and livelihood for more than half a billion people. So that's almost an eighth of society. And scientists tell us that any level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere above 350 parts per million is too dangerous for the survival of these reefs. We are risking the Over time, Pavan Sukhdev has become the global guru on economy and biodiversity. His goal is to convince the world of the importance of these capital assets. Calculating the economic value of nature has become his life's purpose. He can put a figure on an ecosystem as easily as he can assess global losses, at the risk of turning nature into a commodity. The total loss of value every year was almost two to four trillion US dollars, that is two to four million million US dollars. That's almost the same size as the loss that was suffered in the financial meltdown in 2008, which was about five trillion dollars. So that gives you a sense of how big these losses are, and yet they are invisible because we are not accounting for the capital when it disappears, when the forests disappear, when the wetland is closed. We are not accounting for the losses because we are not accounting for the income. The assets are invisible. Same problem. Economic invisibility of nature. La nature n'a pas été produite pour être vendue. Euh, des tas d'objets sont produits spécifiquement pour être vendus. C'est leur destin, je dirais. La nature n'a pas été produite pour être vendue. Ce n'est pas un bien économique comme les autres. La nature n'a pas de valeur économique intrinsèque qu'il faudrait rendre visible, qu'il s'agirait de révéler et que le marché révélerait. Ça, c'est ce qu'on entend aujourd'hui par les tenants de la marchandisation des services écosystémiques, marchandisation de la nature. L'idée qu'il y aurait une valeur intrinsèque qu'on a toujours oubliée, qui est invisible et qu'il faudrait rendre visible. Il y a certainement des gens qui se sentent uneasy de mettre un prix sur la nature. Ils se sentent que la nature est intrinsèquement invaluable, uh, that, uh, you know, bringing the profit motive and sort of associated greed to bear on natural phenomena is somehow just the wrong thing to be doing. Um, I think that's short-sighted. There are many people in the world, it seems, who are very short-sighted. Such as the thousands of protesters who demonstrated in Rio during the 2012 Earth Summit. Rather than turning nature into a commodity, these opponents demanded strong policies to solve the environmental crisis in vain. At 20 years ago, the Earth Summit put sustainable development on the global agenda. Yet, let me be frank, our efforts have not lived up to the measure of the challenge. We are playing political poker with the future of our planet by not acting with the urgency that the situation calls for. More poverty, more conflict, and more environmental destruction. On one side, policies incapable of providing a global solution. On the other, growing markets preserving some species and habitats. Some people have chosen their side. 
the so-called economic efficiency. Early societies deified what we now call natural capital. Um, there was you know, gods for rivers, gods for oceans, gods for the sun. Um, and these were all recognizing the importance of different types of natural capital. Um, we don't deify things today, but uh, we recognize their importance by putting dollar signs in front of them, by making them into capital assets. Um, that you know, reflects the change in our society. Capital is seen as important today. For decades and decades, we have been trying to save biodiversity and, and, uh, and forests and those things out of the goodness of our heart, out of the fact that we know that's the right thing to do. And we have failed. We have failed miserably. Um, and and I, will, I will challenge anybody in the environmental movement about that. So we need to find other instruments that can get us to much bigger scales to be able to address those issues. The facade is discreet. It's home to a business that is growing with each passing year. The Ecosystem Marketplace is a non-profit company based in Washington, D.C., which issues environmental economic reports. And the idea was to create a Bloomberg of environmental markets, where you had literally all the transaction data publicly, transparently, and credibly available, because that, then that stimulates markets. So we created what we call the matrix, which really uh, lays out the 24 different kinds of market instruments. The matrix is the Bible of the markets for ecosystem services. Markets in biodiversity, water, carbon, green tourism, genetic resources. The ecosystem marketplace invented this matrix to show the potential for growth in these new El Dorados. For instance, 10% each year for biodiversity markets, 55% for carbon. Tratar a la naturaleza como un capital, ¿no? Es una barbaridad. Porque quiere decir que se va a incorporar la naturaleza así como se incorpora la tecnología o a las maquinarias, para, a su vez, utilizarlas para invertir y obtener más ganancia. Eso es lo que están diciendo. Están locos. They're not that crazy. They just have a business-oriented mind and the belief that markets can solve the environmental crisis. The idea is gaining ground, slowly but surely convincing a growing number of people. But this idea didn't just come out of the blue. It's been worked on and shaped for over 50 years. La décennie 65-75 est une décennie d'avancée des régulations environnementales. Il y a toute une série de lois qui sont mises en avant pour la qualité de l'eau, la qualité de l'air, la protection des espaces et des espèces. Euh, ça, ça va faire très peur à un certain nombre euh, d'organisations industrielles, de lobbies, qui vont essayer de mettre en place un contre-mouvement, un contre-feu euh, à ces avancées environnementales. Euh, C'est ce que les historiens américains appellent l'environmental backlash, donc le retour de bâton environnemental. These lobbyists found a spokesperson in Ronald Reagan. During his campaign, the Republican candidate accused President Carter of stifling growth with his environmental laws. He visited a factory where thousands of people had just been laid off, according to him, because of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Reagan's tour of the decaying hearths and furnaces was a symbolic effort to remind voters that tough times arrived here while Jimmy Carter was president. It was closed down for two reasons, dumping and the EPA, forcing costs on them for uh, environmental protection uh, to meet their mandates that uh, could not be afforded. There was no way to do it.
Lorsque Reagan arrive à la Maison Blanche, il va mettre en place une politique de régression des régulations environnementales. L'agence, la Environmental Protection Agency, va voir son budget diminuer de 20 à 25 Il en confie la direction à un de ses proches qui est chargé d'en organiser la casse. Il va assouplir toutes les régulations sur l'exploitation forestière, sur la loi sur l'air et les pollutions de l'air. Environmental regulations are cut back or made more flexible. And this opens the door to the creation of market instruments supposed to save nature. When George Bush takes office, he continues the deregulation policy. One of the first testing grounds is the wetlands, vast ancient swamps vital for biodiversity. Businesses would really like to use these areas where nature has been left alone. So Bush invents. No net loss of wetlands. No net loss of wetlands. With this new law, the president puts in place the structure that would underpin environmental markets. His method for preserving wetlands is to be compatible with economic growth. Businesses will be able to destroy parts of the wetlands as long as they offset the damage they cause. Et à partir de 1991, les premières banques de biodiversité, d'habitat puis d'espèces, vont être mises en place autour de cette idée du no net loss. What we're seeing that's exciting is that it's starting to, to get uptake in other places. China, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, we're starting to see some real interest in these kinds of an instrument for compensation around biodiversity loss. This jungle in Borneo is worth some $34 million. The state conceded it to an investment fund that set up the world's largest mitigation bank. It intends to make a profit by offering its credits to customers such as pension funds and insurance companies. There's not very much of that forest left in Sabah and there's not very much left in good condition. There's maybe only about 80,000 hectares of good lowland dipricut forest, they call primary forest, that hasn't been logged. So that's what makes protecting this lowland forest very important. And that's where the, the main iconic species actually live in lowland forest. It's where the fruiting trees are, you know, so that's where the orangutans are, the elephants. Malawa Biobank is um, a 34,000 hectare forest reserve in Malaysian Borneo. Uh, and what's unique about this particular project is that it seeks to take a commercial approach rather than a charitable approach to, to conservation. It's trying to monetize the ecological value in the forest. Borneo is the third largest island in the world. Its forest is almost 150 million years old, and a century ago, it covered the entire island. Today, two-thirds of it have vanished. Because of logging and palm oil plantations. In just a few years, the island has been transformed into an ocean of monoculture. The ecological catastrophe is complete. At this rate, the last remaining orangutans will have disappeared by the end of the decade, just like the pygmy elephant and other species. If Malawa has um, converted that ecological value to a monetary value, instead of being worth nothing, and those banting and um, orangutan being worth absolutely no, having no value, then the palm oil company next door would have to pay that price in order to be able to destroy it 
and develop it. The Malua Bank sells its jungle credits to palm oil producers and any other food processing companies around the world that use the oil in their products. Will forcing those who destroy primary forests to pay for this destruction save the great apes? Entonces, esta es una lógica muy perversa porque quiere decir que el que tiene plata puede comprar los bonos y destruir la naturaleza. Los certificados de biodiversidad son permisos para contaminar, son permisos para destruir la naturaleza. Por eso este mecanismo es perverso. En vez de preservar la naturaleza, genera exactamente lo contrario, porque el que tiene dinero no tiene problema. Compra estos certificados y con ello justifica su destrucción de la naturaleza. Malua Bank's economic model is not yet profitable, but the heavyweights of the market believe in its future. In 2013, HSBC was the first bank to publish a report on natural capital. These environmental markets, originally seen as niches, are looking ever more promising. Natural capital uh, issues are fundamental to how we will live in the future. Um, we may see population migration, species migration, we may see um, huge changes in the way people live. Investors are thinking more about natural capital because they realise that it can offer a constraint and an opportunity. Um, they, they want to think about how their investments will generate long-term value for their stakeholders and that means thinking about how the supply of natural capital may change, how disruption might occur in relation to natural capital resources. The next wave of, of, of real uh, financial gains could be environmental markets, for sure. With a bank, you look at both the, the risk and the opportunity around these issues. And I think all of them are recognizing that natural resources are very important. So the J.P. Morgan Chases, the Merrill Lynch's, and uh, Bank of America, all of these uh, major banks, they're the institutions that invest in the businesses that are doing the projects uh, that are having an effect on biodiversity, positive or negative. So they're, they're a very important piece of our, of our coalition. So that is who is behind the ecosystem marketplace. Who is interested in these markets, in their potential, and who sits on their boards and committees. When we look at the development of biodiversity markets, we find some very well-known actors, banks in particular. And what's curious and scary at the same time is that oftentimes these are the very same banks that were also very actively involved in the trading um, that led to the last large financial crisis. Banks, of course, don't do that because they have at the heart uh, protection of nature. They do that because they see a business in this. They want to become the ones who provide the trading platforms. Bank of America Merrill Lynch was fined a record $17 billion by the American government on charges linked to the subprime mortgage crisis. J.P. Morgan Chase, the largest bank in the USA, had to pay a $13 billion fine for the same charges. Citigroup, saved from bankruptcy by the same government, paid hundreds of millions of dollars to escape legal proceedings by disaffected clients. We can even find companies set up by former employees of Goldman Sachs, the same bank that made billions in profit by speculating on the crisis. Can 
and leopards change their spots? You might even think they're the bad guys. Maybe they even have been the bad guys in the past. But sometimes they were the bad guys because they were making mistakes. They didn't know better. And see whether you can convert a bad guy or somebody who's just not paying attention into being an ally. Because if we can do that, we can get so much more done. That was the boss of one of the biggest nature protection agencies in the US. His remarks are somewhat surprising, aren't they? The Nature Conservancy has almost one million members and protects millions of acres of land and marine areas around the world. But is this naivety or strategy? I had a, a really uh, fortunate experience when I worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, I had been a mainstream investment banker for more than 20 years. And then my final position before I joined the Nature Conservancy was leading an environmental effort for the firm. Having a CEO that has all of his experience coming from the world of banking and corporate banking in particular, um, will continue to look for the solutions to the crisis where those solutions don't hurt the very sector that has made his career. I'm a banker. I understand the difference between prices and values. I also understand that nature has huge value, which we have simply not learned how to appreciate. Pavan Sukhdev is the global reference in this sector, the man with the most influence. He made his career at Deutsche Bank. He argues that putting a price on nature doesn't mean turning it into a commodity. He simply hopes to make states more aware of their ecological riches and make companies more responsible. Can a banker change his own nature too? Economics is mere weaponry. The direction in which you shoot is an ethical choice. I have made that ethical choice to shoot in the right direction using the same weapon. With his economic weapon, the ecologist banker has targeted the politicians. He has already won the battle of ideas with international institutions and their directors. The situation in European Union, of course, could be better, uh, despite a lot of things which we are doing. Uh, uh, the facts are that still only 17% of our habitats and species are in good environmental status, and only 11% of ecosystems are in such kind of status. I think it's nothing to hide. Obviously, it failed. It's the dark side of development. Corporations that ensure our comfortable lives and causing damages we'd rather ignore. Oil, chemical and steel industries. Areas where the air is choked with carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, benzene, hydrocarbons, metals. Europe urbanized, it industrialized. In these areas, the people are ill and biodiversity is dying out. When you finance biodiversity, you can logically look to the public funds, but at the end of the day, you know, many look at the public funds and there are many needs which you would need to address through the public funds. So it is utmost important that you use also private funding. And uh, that's why this innovative financing mechanisms logic started to emerge. I think the states today are en train to consider that the environment is too much and that the ecological policies will be seen later. So, they have abandoned the ecological issue, they have not abandoned the issue of economic issue. However, the ecological crisis is an opportunity economic opportunity. Et les États mettent en place les outils pour transformer cette contrainte, qui peut coûter cher si on la considère seulement comme une contrainte, en opportunité économique pour les acteurs privés. In Brussels, where the lobbies capital of the European Union, you have between 15,000 and 50,000 lobbyists, and most of them work for corporations. We want to have this partnership with the business sector uh, because without that partnership, 
uh, we have uh, practically no real chance to succeed. Twenty years ago, we still thought that nations and politics could save the planet. A hundred heads of state attended the Earth Summit in Rio, the world's largest gathering. Just a handful of corporations were present. At the time, the idea of business companies helping protect the environment occurred to no one. Back in 1992, in that Earth Summit, uh, there were mainly representatives from governments and a few from civil society. And they actually all thought that business was the reason for all our problems. Business was bad, business was damaging the environment or whatever other negative implications there would be. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development is a group of some 200 corporations, many of them actually with a very bad uh, record on environmental issues like Rio Tinto, Shell, BP, etc. And it was created in 92 with the goal of influencing the original Rio uh, summit. In two decades, multinational corporations have fashioned an effective lobby group. I think we're slowly but certainly moving to a stage where it will become equal partners in a discussion. I mean, maybe I'm expressing a hope more than a reality today, but it's certainly a trend that I see happen. Only if we get business and governments as equal partners in this debate will we find the solutions and the scale to the solutions that the world needs. The bet has paid off. At the last Earth Summit, the United Nations rolled out the red carpet for the private companies. Rio Plus 20, there were more than 2,700 representatives of the private sector. There were the PDG of Unilever, the PDG of Puma, there were Coca-Cola, Shell, Rio Tinto. Rio Plus 20 is an international movement that has been working for many years. There were the PDG of Unilever, the PDG of Puma, there were Coca-Cola, Shell, Rio Tinto. All these corporations met in a luxury hotel in Rio. Oil chemical, steel giants, themselves regularly accused of practices harmful to the environment. It means we do have to, in good management sense, explore risks and opportunities. We have to understand our ecosystem. Just to bring that alive a little bit, this is the Nestle commitment to no deforestation. I think we were the first major company to make this kind of commitment. And it was pretty clear to us the area that we really needed to think about was biodiversity and ecosystem. Do Chemical, c'est le producteur avec Monsanto euh, de l'agent orange, qui est un défoliant qui a été utilisé euh, par l'armée américaine pendant la guerre du Vietnam et qui a causé des milliers de cancers, de malformations à la naissance chez toutes les personnes qui ont été exposées à cette herbicide. Do Chemical est aussi associé euh, via le rachat d'une entreprise euh, qui s'appelait Union Carbide en 2001 à la catastrophe de Bhopal. Bhopal in India is where a factory exploded in 1984 releasing 40 tons of chemicals, killing 10,000 and causing sickness to another 300,000. The same companies that belong to this group in their real daily activities in their lobby towards government are lobbying for exactly the opposite, are lobbying for uh, policies that benefit their commercial interests, that don't affect their activities, that they don't need to make any structural change, that they can keep on having devastating impacts on communities, on the environment. It only took 20 years for the banker, the politician, and the businessman, a symbolic trinity, to begin speaking in harmony about the environment. Post for economic history has been a very exciting time because it's seen the emergence of the multinational corporation. But part of that emergence and part of that success has been through the deregulation and the innovations in trade and capital markets. So, Basically, I do believe that I'm not talking about environmental interests here and that I'm talking about new industrial policy needed. So it's actually not about green growth, it is about growth 
full stop. Thank you. ¿Es posible crecer económicamente y al mismo tiempo preservar el equilibrio con la naturaleza? Falso. No es posible. El crecimiento tiene un límite y ese límite es la capacidad de regeneración de nuestro planeta Tierra. Y ya hemos llegado a sobrepasar ese límite. ¿Por qué nos quieren vender esta ficción? Porque quien lo necesita es el capital. Porque el momento en el cual el capital, al capital se le dice, no puedes crecer más, el capital entra en una crisis. We need a clean, more progressive economy. A green economy. An economy that is good for people, business and the planet. Pavan has been at the forefront of a community of economists, development experts, environmental experts, social science experts. The United Nations was converted too, to a point that its representative for the environment named Pavan Sukdev as its ambassador. Today, it's a banker who embodies environmental protection in the name of all the nations of the world. Las Naciones Unidas en ese sentido se están convirtiendo en los promotores de la inversión privada en el planeta. Estoy muy en contra de ese rol que eh, fundamentalmente se está desarrollando en el marco de las Naciones Unidas. En nuestra organización, que es una organización indígena, estamos muy preocupados por esta economía de la economía verde. Uh, Primero pensamos, bueno, well, eso suena bien, que los economistas del mundo are starting to appreciate you know, the greenness of the world, green economy, it sounds good, but as we started to look at it, we started to see that it was all about privatization of nature. So are the UN, business corporations, bankers and politicians all in bed together? Is there an international plot against nature? And what if this alliance was the only means of saving the planet? Environmentalists like the Nature Conservancy are working with companies like Dow Chemical and many other companies. Sometimes people say to me, Mark, why would you work with companies that have such big environmental footprints? And I say, that's exactly why we should work with them. Ecological NGOs need funds too, because protecting nature is expensive and donations are not enough. Some have joined forces with multinationals and signed partnership deals. They now have board members coming straight from the business sector. Many corporations have also recruited former employees of environmental NGOs. But in this game, who is influencing who? Now, if you're in the business that Coca-Cola is in, it's pretty easy to help them understand they should care about nature's ability to produce the clean water they need. And of course, they get it. They said, what kinds of uh, investments in forests will yield the biggest returns in terms of clean water? Now, from an old-fashioned environmental perspective, you might think, well, that's kind of a crass question. But if your goal is to mobilize industrial players, like people in the beverage industry, to invest more in nature, it's very important to have answers to those questions. I don't think there's a conflict there. To me, that's win-win. They lent their name, they lent their logo, they lent their contacts, they lent their expertise to the development of a market that many of them also know will not bring benefits to communities. Wow. 
We would, however, like to believe in this brave new world. Believe that the bank and the business corporations have changed. Believe that they have faith in natural capital and are committed to protecting nature. So what if banks and corporations really have woken up to their impact and dependence on ecological investment? Is it a metamorphosis or greenwash? You know, I'm an ambitious guy, as you may have noticed. I think we can do this, change the rules of the game. So I'm really looking forward to the next 10 years because it will completely transform the way we run our economies. We will strike a balance between financial or economical success, natural or environmental and social success. And if we can do that, then the vision that I've said before, nine billion people all living well within the boundaries of the planet will become a reality because that's how we then measure the way our economy performs. The promise of additional profits, coupled with the desire to improve their image, has certainly encouraged some businesses to commit themselves to preserving the environment. Valet is a mining giant and a member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Its train is an institution in Brazil. Every year, from the heart of the Amazon to the Atlantic Ocean, the company transports 100 million tons of iron ore over 500 miles. The population benefits from this valley train, as they call it. Valley operates in 38 different countries with a turnover of more than $46 billion. Aware of its ecological impact, the company committed itself to the green economy. It decided to reforest certain areas of the Amazon. It has already replanted over 100,000 acres of trees, with a further 400,000 in the pipeline. Vale, aus Brasilien, der Sieger des Public Eye Awards 2012. And yet in 2012, Valley received the Public Eye Award, the prize for corporate irresponsibility. With these nominations, some of the worst examples of corporate irresponsibility in the last year have been identified. What is needed is not just a recognition of what is wrong with, say, their environmental and labor practices, but systemic improvements. I hope that these awards will raise consciousness of some of the kinds of worst practices that are going on in the world today. What did Valet do to deserve such an award? What did Valet do to trigger the creation of an international victims organization while spending more than a billion dollars each year promoting sustainable development? Along its railway track, there are, amongst other things, Five factories working 24 hours a day, transforming the ore into cast iron. In the process, spitting out foul-smelling and hazardous smoke. And just below, there's a village. This is the cai das indústrias todos os dias não tem como manter as coisas limpas a gente limpa hoje aí limpei pela manhã agora já está assim a minha mãe que nunca fumou tem o pulmão completamente dessa cor se continuarmos aqui é isso morte Mas eu queria que eles entendessem que a gente está lutando pelo direito nosso de viver, né? Que todo ser humano ele tem o direito de viver, até porque a gente nasceu para viver, né? 
se Deus nos fez, foi para que a gente tivesse vida. E vida em abundância. O que nós estamos tendo aqui é poluição em abundância. Porque minha mulher estava sozinha aí depois, quando ela chegou, passou um, uns três anos, ela começou a sentir a, o câncer de, de mama. Daí foi, foi para Teresina lá, foi feita a cirurgia para lá, tirou o seio. Daí o doutor falou, se ela morava perto de alguma cidade luz que tinha poluição, ela falou que, que morava. Daí mandou ela, ó, oh, você sai de lá mesmo, para outro lugar, aí, senão, aí você não vai conviver não. Daí nós... Yet, in the eyes of the world, the world of business and shareholders, of course, Valley has built a reputation for being green. In the heart of the Amazon, the multinational operates the planet's most important iron mine. And even if it willingly plants trees to offset its impact, it also knows how to transform its good deeds into profitable shares for sales on the markets. These investments allow it to be listed on the Sustainable Development Index of the Stock Exchange. Esse fato da Vale ter investido ou a Vale ter colocado e, na Bolsa de Valores essa responsabilidade ambiental com uma forma de captar novos recursos, logicamente que essa preocupação é muito mais financeira do que propriamente ambiental. While claiming to replant the Amazonian forest, Vale is only growing a single species of tree, eucalyptus. Olha, aqui a gente já percebe que a camada é nem mais baixa, né? E o solo muito compactado. Para gerar vida no solo, tem que ser um solo poroso. Porque qual é a principal função do solo? É armazenar água. Não armazenando água, não acontece o processo biológico do solo, né? Os micro-organismos têm dificuldade em trabalhar. Todo esse, esse processo aqui, ele vai levar aquilo que a gente já está chamando de deserto, né? Deserto Verde. A few miles away in a natural forest. Primeiro o que a gente sente aqui é um cheiro totalmente diferente, né? Ah, primeiro a coloração, o, o cheiro assim da terra é um cheiro de vida mesmo. A gente percebe que esse solo aqui, diferente do que nós vimos inúmeras raízes de outras espécies de plantas que estão ao redor das maiores aqui, né? Então isso aqui torna o solo arável, aquele solo que tem condições de absorver água da chuva e dar as condições ideais para que os micro-organismos possam trabalhar esse solo. Essa matéria morta que a gente vê aqui vai se transformar em vida novamente. In 30 years, all the land with eucalyptus will become barren. Until then, the financial markets will have rewarded Valley for their green investment. Ultimately, the multinational will make even more profit by selling its trees for biofuel. Disguising a monoculture into a millennia-old Amazonian rainforest, this is one of the great deceptions of the green economy. A lie that consists in claiming that markets can protect biodiversity. Biodiversity markets are not uh, an entirely new invention. Uh, there are other types of markets with parts of nature that we can look to, to see how they function and who wins and who loses when those markets are put in place. Delegates from around the world gathered here by the hundreds to discuss climate change and its consequences. Global warming would be far more permanent. In Japan in December 1997, a majority of countries signed the Kyoto Protocol. They accepted the risks brought by climate change and committed themselves to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. One leading theory is that it's caused when carbon dioxide and other man-made gases are released into the air and trap heat, much like a greenhouse. Science was telling us that we had a problem with carbon emissions in the atmosphere, and we were starting to figure out the, the, the ways to solve those problems. And of course, forests, planting forests, maintaining forests, and landscapes, uh, sustainable agricultural activity, uh, is what people agreed was the, 
the cheapest and most effective way to abate, which is to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere. It really doesn't matter where it comes from or where it comes out of, so you can have a global trading platform for carbon that's perfect in terms of a global commodity market. Kyoto put in place market mechanisms to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. The treaty set a global emissions limit, which could not be exceeded. Each industrialized nation that signed the treaty received a carbon quota. These credits are then distributed to the polluting industries. If Company A doesn't use all of its carbon credits, it can then sell them to Company B, which has exceeded its quota. Another possibility is for Company B to invest in clean energy sources in a less industrialized nation. What we're trying to do there is essentially persuade people to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, and stabilize the climate by giving them a financial incentive to do that. And the offset system, uh, which for example allows for offsets because of the growth of forests, is a way of rewarding uh, people for providing more natural capital and generating ecosystem services from that. That's why Western companies began investing in protecting nature or planting forests in developing nations. From small businesses to huge multinationals such as Microsoft, Disney, Air France, or even the giants of the oil industry. Uganda has attracted some of these carbon investments. get the volumes and the amount of carbon that we have, you need to measure the trees, like diameters, heights, and then you get those values and feed them to the formula to get the carbon quantities that we have. These men work in a profession that did not exist before the signing of the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change. They are carbon hunters. Height 2 is 20 20.6, 29.6, 25.0, 18.1, 25.4. Each ton of CO2 stored in the trees equals one carbon credit. Credits which the German company Global Woods offers to the international market. Und damit ist es eben so, dass man als, wenn man hier in Europa zu viel CO2 emittiert, kann man durch den Kauf solcher Zertifikate diesen sogenannten äh, Kohlenstofffußabdruck kompensieren und einen aktiven und sehr nachhaltigen Beitrag dazu leisten, dass das Klima geschützt wird. Carbon hunting continues to be a promising source of future wealth for those first pioneering investors. But can these young trees save the climate? Can they absorb the pollution from Western countries and compensate for the overconsumption of natural resources? In any case, it's the main solution offered by international politics and the markets to protect the planet. The developed nations pay to have trees planted rather than trying to change their ways. Auf den 5000 Hektar Fläche, auf denen wir bis jetzt Bäume gepflanzt haben in Uganda, werden ungefähr eine Million Tonnen Kohlenstoff gebunden. Und das entspricht der Menge an, an CO2, die in Mitteleuropa 100.000 Leute in einem Jahr emittieren. Und in der letzten Zeit, was sie in den Markt sind Papiere. Papiere, die sagen, dass wenn du das kaufst, du es das kaufst, 20 toneladas de dióxido de carbono que ahora tú puedes emitir porque en algún lugar del mundo hay un bosque que está allí absorbiendo 20 toneladas de dióxido de carbono. We really studied this and, and we became alarmed because the numbers weren't adding up uh, and it was just a false mechanism that was being set up that allows the polluters of the north to continue to expand the combustion 
of fossil fuels. Bata ni so kubanga, bubaba galanti tuvewo, bata ni so kureta ate emundu. Harenga bubaja batu gambanti, tulibari lanu wa wabwe, ni ate mulanu wa u. Umurete la AK-47, daradaro ya bachari mulanu wa u. Basiba njala, ngatibali de, umuntu sobolo kusiba njala, no gele na kusome, no bobu za na skuru fizu wo kuzidja, tewali. Na heba tuchiki ya tugele tuliba mforesti, Bajia burungi wale metu tu siba, kubanga fete tu ina biya kuruani santi tu riba biyo ba tuna tuna akolo bura be, bajia cheba gala tu tu benga tu gera mubuntu, na mubuntu kumu kwata na muteka mukomera tenga tachi harima tia fune sente katawa genda zidjau. In the past, this plantation land was used often illegally by the villagers, but in such a poor country, these people grew just enough to eat or to sell at market or to feed their cattle. But everything changed with the arrival of global woods. Vacancies for forest security manager. The jobs are to ensure that a forest plantation stays free of damage caused by illegal grazing. Abilities and qualifications. Trained in policing or army skills, including martial arts. vorgesehen zum Pflanzen von Bäumen ähm, und nicht zum Anbau von, äh, von Getreide oder um, um, äh, um Kühe zu halten. Was wir aber machen, wir gehen da sehr proaktiv ran. Uns ist das bewusst, dass äh, selbst so eine gute Sache wie Bäume pflanzen durchaus zu Konflikten führen kann. Aber wir gehen auf die Menschen zu. These systems I'm talking about are starting to use our trees, our forests, especially in the global south, in developing countries, in the backyard of indigenous peoples who are brothers and sisters, to use it as far as this big carbon market scheme. How should land be used? To live on and grow food or to replant trees? In order to protect the forests in various locations in Africa, the villagers have been expelled and their homes burnt to the ground. In Honduras, dozens of farmers have already died protesting against these sorts of expulsions. How can trees be worth more than people? Our people are literally dying. We are dying. It is a form of, of, of genocide. It is a form of genocide against our people. But for now, nothing can stop the charge of the raging bull of Wall Street. It has barely a second thought for who it tramples underfoot when it finds new sectors in which to make money. Hay que tener claro que el que invierta en esos certificados no va a invertir en esos certificados por un buen corazón, va a invertir para obtener una ganancia. ¿Y cómo va a obtener esa ganancia? ¿Cómo va a hacer que ese su certificado valga cada vez más? Eso es lo que va a generar más bien un mecanismo especulativo, por eso es insostenible. They use speculation as, as if it were a bad word, right? I don't necessarily see speculation as always a bad thing. Yeah, basically, what speculation is, is people taking risks. And hopefully, the people who are taking the risks can assume the risks if they don't pan out. Already, we've seen millions of dollars being invested in projects that protect forests. Why? because people are hoping that they will be able to make money selling carbon credits in the future. They're not making money now. Most of them are not making money now. They're speculating. During my lifetime, we've had plenty of stock market crashes. So could these environmental markets be liable to crashes of the same sort? The answer is yes, in principle they could. And in fact, we've actually lived through one of these recently. Because the price of carbon on the markets has collapsed from around $30 a ton 
to less than three. How can we entrust our future to a market that sometimes recognizes the value of nature and sometimes doesn't? The Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and the World Bank have announced a plan to offer World Bank green bonds to... Major banks and businesses have offered green bonds, a monetary product invented by the World Bank. They have already issued tens of billions of dollars worth of bonds, in order, they say, to redirect finance to serve the environment. What is the guarantee that this so-called green finance will benefit the planet? The likelihood that banks, traders, uh, will be developing the hardware and software of this new market in a way that benefits them rather than benefits nature will be the same as was the case in the financial crisis 2008-2009. These financial derivatives, financial products that were being traded very rapidly were not helping house owners to safely finance their home. No, they were developed and used to increase the profits that banks could make. This is where the financial crisis started. The banks played on the dream of owning your own home. In the USA, they used the promise of this illusion to lure modest households with precarious finances. Once the families were no longer able to repay their loans, the house of cards collapsed, leading to the subprime crisis that made millions of Americans homeless. The world tipped into a social crisis. Well, we've seen the consequences of financialization. We've seen the collapse of Wall Street. We are witnessing around the world this hungry money, which is only looking at how to make the next profit, devastating economies, devastating ecosystems, devastating the planet. And for them to say that the reason the planet has been destroyed is because there wasn't a price, all we have to do is a map. Wherever there was a price, the minerals have been mined, the earth has been raped. Wherever, where there was reverence and respect, nature stands in her integrity. The evidence is very, very clear. Price has led to degradation and destruction. Pricing and financialization is a disease that we have to overcome. It's like a cancer on this planet and in the human mind. But what is the connection between junk bonds, speculators and houses, and forests, insects and orangutans? In the past, when people wanted to buy a property, they went to their bank to ask for a loan. The bank would assess their ability to repay the loan. The financial crisis made everyone realise that loans were no longer just the domain of banks. In fact, household debts are transformed into securities, bought by investors, then split up and mixed in with other debts to create derivatives more or less risky, therefore more or less profitable, and finally put onto financial markets. One day, too many homeowners were unable to continue paying back their debts, triggering a flood of bankruptcies. The world then discovered that some investors had speculated on the inability of homeowners to repay their loans. It's not that big a stretch of an imagination to use the same logic of dividing up the biodiversity credits and dividing up biodiversity in a sense and saying you can now speculate on the future date of extinction of that species. On voit se développer des propositions importantes aux États-Unis pour développer de façon très très large tout un système de produits dérivés qui sont des produits d'assurance pour préserver des espèces, pour préserver des habitats. 
Moi, j'ai acheté auprès d'une compagnie d'assurance, d'un fonds financier, un titre qui me permet de m'assurer contre le risque de disparition, que je fasse disparaître cette espèce. Et ce titre-là, je peux le revendre. Et donc, il y a un marché secondaire qui ne porte pas sur l'objet initial. Que le dérivé soit sur un oiseau, soit sur du riz, soit sur du pétrole ou soit sur une action, ça n'a aucune importance. La nature du, la nature du, du support initial n'a pas d'importance. Ce qui est important, c'est le rendement à la fin. Donc s'il y a du rendement possible hein, en spéculant sur la, comment dire, la, la disparition d'une espèce, mais pourquoi pas Yes, securitizations are sometimes bad and they led to the financial debacle. Those were bad securitizations. But securitizations also can be very, very good. That doesn't mean there should be no securitizations. That means we must work harder. But just because there's a chance of something going wrong, or just because there's a chance that someone might not like it, should we stop and not do it? I think that would be a foolhardy mistake. But if things were to go wrong, what would the consequences be this time around? Is there a level of acceptable risk? Investment funds are already proposing species portfolios. You could choose 50 orangutan, 30 fly, or 40 locust credits. The Amazon rainforest is already listed on the world's first green stock exchange. It's playing God. It's pretending to play God. And when we find out, and when those who promote the concept find out that even today they can't play God, the damage will be done. For me, these fears are, are motivated fears. I mean, there, there are those who actually want to trade nature, as in they would love to have the ability to buy and sell species, as you say. Well, that's too bad, because that's not our job. Our job is to ensure that the value is appreciated, recognized, internalized. There are others who are politically uh, ill-disposed towards any form of capital being recognized. And for them, it's a religion. They will fight against anything that uses the word economics or capital. Some people will say, well, but this is, this is all conspiracy. This is not going to happen. This is not the purpose of nature accounting. We don't want that. But how will they prevent this kind of development once the methodologies are there to start speculating um, to start uh, trading biodiversity. You provide the instruments, and the use of those instruments will be out of your hands. At stake is our future on the planet. Can we really mortgage that out and place it on the financial markets? Lots of banks have committed to protecting species for just 50 years, just enough time to make a profit yet just a speck of dust as far as the earth is concerned. Si vous laissez la question de quelle est la valeur économique de la nature aux financiers, aux fonds d'investissement, aux fonds spéculatifs, aux banques, leur approche, ça va être une approche purement financière de la nature et ça, c'est très négatif. Mais je ne vois pas au nom de quoi le politique ne pourrait pas dire oui à une valeur économique comme c'est le cas pour l'immense majorité des biens que nous produisons et que nous consommons, mais pas de valeur spéculative, pas de mécanisme qui permette à cette valeur de l'économie réelle, hop, d'être détournée par une financiarisation excessive. La única forma de salir de esta crisis ambientale es saliendo de una lógica de mercado donde es el mercado el que nos domina y pasar a una lógica donde es la conciencia humana la que define y decide qué es lo más apropiado para restaurar el equilibrio de la naturaleza. We need to learn to get out of the valuation on the market which is only price, where everything has a price and nothing has value to everything of nature having value and not being measured in price and finding other ways for humanity as humanity for most of its history has done. It has not related to nature's values through price.
The world of finance toyed with the homes and households of America, sparking a crisis around the world. Only a handful of experts foresaw the danger of the mechanisms we engendered. Now we all know. The same recipes are applied, but this time their toy is nature. Is it a good idea to leave the planet in their hands? une prise de sang et que vous allez dans, au laboratoire vous faire mesurer vos ions du sang. Hein. Le sodium, tiens, intéressant, c'est un ion de mer, ça. Hein. Les chlorures, euh, le potassium, euh, le magnésium, intéressant. Pourquoi on a ça dans notre sang Parce que ça vient de l'océan ancestral. Aujourd'hui, hein, l'histoire d'un sang humain, il raconte l'histoire de l'océan. Hein. Quand la vie sort de l'océan, il y a à peu près euh, 440 millions d'années, à peu près. Gardons l'humilité, on est un morceau d'océan. C'est du vie, on ne peut pas s'en passer. On ne mange que du vivant, on ne coopère qu'avec du vivant. Si on oublie ça, bon, ben c'est un suicide collectif, tout simplement. Hein. Puis souvent, on me dit, oui, vous battez pour sauver la planète. Ils sont fous, la planète, complètement. Hein. On se bat pour garder du bien-être de l'humain sur la planète. C'est un petit peu différent, finalement. 